Just a couple of service notes. We're going to continue our midweek Lent theme, God on Trial. It's my prayer that you will see the progression of the readings and the beauty of the fact that God came to this earth to be on trial for you and for me. What tremendous peace and comfort that gives us. You'll notice the order of service is a little different from what we usually observe. We have the sermon at the beginning, and that's intentional, so that we focus the rest of our attention in this service on the, the uh, accounts of the institution of the Lord's Supper, and then the Lord's Supper itself. The Lord's Supper is for our members, those of the Wisconsin Synod. We welcome all guests and visitors to uh, this evening. It's my prayer that the Holy Spirit indeed fills you with comfort over the news of a Savior who gave his body and blood on Calvary's cross and in the Lord's Supper for us. One other service note is that on page five we have the Lord's Prayer. That is the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. I don't have it written out for you today in our folder. And regarding communion, we usher up the center aisle and we distribute communion on both sides. There will be an elder with the tray of bread first and then an elder with the tray of individual cups and then I'll follow with the common cup. If you chose an individual cup, there are receptacles on the end of each pew for you to place your empty cup. Again, a good evening and a welcome to all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's join in the opening.
22. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So far the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Christian friends. I wonder what it was like. I wonder what it was like on this night, this Passover night. Oh, I know a little bit about what Passover is like today among modern Jews. They still celebrate it the way they have for thousands of, thousands of years. There is a leader, usually the head of the household, who is the leader of the Seder or the Passover meal. And he says the same things. And the people there, usually as family members, respond with the same things. There's the same food, the same leg of lamb, the same bitter herb sauces, the same unleavened bread, the same cup of wine. And it's a very somber night. It's a joyful time because they're together as family. We would probably liken it to Christmas for us Christians. It's a joyful night, but it's somber. It's quiet. And I imagine that's the way things were for the most part on this night here described for us, what we would call the Last Supper, the last time that Jesus would celebrate the Passover with his disciples. Historians tell us that it's likely during the Passover that Jerusalem swelled ten times in population. Think about that. Ten times in a day before there were motels with 10 to 20 floors up. 10 times the population. And yet I imagine things were very quiet there in Jerusalem. Maybe you could hear one family of Jewish people singing one of the Passover Psalms, or maybe you could hear one especially loud leader of the Passover celebration that night, or maybe the expression, the response of the people. But in general, I envision things on this night to have been very quiet except for a small portion. You see, it had been weeks earlier, maybe even a couple months earlier, that the Jewish religious leaders had decided, this is it. This Jesus has to go. The high priest himself said it's better that one man die for the people than the whole nation die. So they had put into motion for quite some time now that Jesus was going to be put to death. The only question was how and when. Well, they had a golden opportunity here. It was the Passover. And instead of being up in Galilee where the Jewish religious leaders were not, he was now there in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the Jewish religious leaders. They had him right on their own turf. But he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, as you probably celebrated, with tremendous popularity. People were thrilled to see him. Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of David. Hosanna in the highest. They were thrilled. And the more the people appreciated him, the more the Jewish religious leaders hated him and heightened their resolve, he's got to go. But it's the Passover. How are we going to do it with so many people around? Well, probably you know that during this Holy Week, day after day, as Jesus was in the temple, various groups of Jesus' enemies sent him a delegation to question him with their tough questions, which they were sure they were going to discredit Jesus with, but Jesus turned the tables on them every time and sent them packing. In fact, at one point, he spoke very, very discouragingly of the Pharisees. You whitewashed tombs. 
You are blind people. When you win one of a, a convert over, you make that person twice a son of hell as you are. He scourged them with his words. But now, most recently, they had an insider, Judas, one who was willing to betray Jesus for the price they had set. He was going to keep them informed of the time. And so on this Passover evening, while the rest of Jerusalem was probably quietly celebrating, these religious leaders were busy scurrying around planning, concerned about how they were going to carry out what they knew needed to be done because the Passover celebration was only going to last a couple more days and then Jesus would be gone up to Galilee. But not here. Not here in what Luke describes. Jesus in an upper room, probably an upstairs, a second floor room in a building, probably a home there in Jerusalem. And he's with his disciples. And it's just them. The 13 of them. And he's enjoying it immensely. It's not the first time Jesus had wanted to spend time alone with his disciples and had actually accomplished getting his disciples alone with him. He had done that repeatedly during his three-year ministry. We hear from time to time that Jesus withdrew with his disciples quietly, and they went away by themselves. And usually Jesus spent the time praying to his heavenly Father without interruption or teaching his disciples. Okay? So no doubt Jesus was thrilled to be able to spend a couple quiet hours with his disciples on this night. Meanwhile, Outside, his enemies reply, his death. Their evil plot, but God's gracious, loving plan to save every sinner. Incredible. As they are in that upper, in that upper room, it's not that Jesus is just kind of hanging out with his disciples, shooting the breeze. No, you know that they are there to celebrate the Passover with Jesus. This wasn't the first time. It was likely, in fact, the third time Jesus had celebrated the Passover with his disciples. What they didn't know, that Jesus knew it was going to be the last. They were there to do what the law of the Jews required, to celebrate Passover as the Jews had celebrated it for centuries. And every year, God's faithful people did that. They got together and celebrated the Passover. You remember what it commemorated? You'll hear about it in a few minutes in our reading from Exodus chapter 12. The Jews were under slavery in Egypt, and the plagues came, and Pharaoh refused to let them go. So one final plague. The angel of death was going to be sent to every household. But where the blood of the lamb had been painted on the doorpost, the angel of death would pass over. And the lives in that home would be spared. Among the Jews, not a single person died, but among the Egyptians, every firstborn male, both of humans and animals, died. And the Jews were then instructed to celebrate that event every year. And that's what the disciples and Jesus were doing on that night. But they were also looking forward. As they celebrated the Passover, again, always done the same way, speaking the same words between the leader and the people who are gathered, Jesus adds a twist, something completely out of the ordinary, something never spoken before at a Passover. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant. This is my body of the new covenant, the bread and the wine, a new covenant. To remind the Jews of the old covenant that they had established, that the Lord had established with them back on Mount Sinai, 1,400 years earlier, where God said, I will be your God, and here are my laws. You obey them, and you will be my people. And the people all said, yes, we will do it, Lord. And you know how long that lasted. Moses comes down from the mountain a few days later, and they're worshiping a golden calf. That old covenant never worked, not because it was God's fault, because it was the people's fault. So God now establishes a new covenant, and Jesus is on the cusp 
of establishing that new covenant here on this Thursday evening as he's gathered with his disciples. A covenant where the Jews don't act, where no one acts. God requires nothing of sinful people in this covenant. He does it all. And he does it all through his son, and Jesus knew that was exactly what he was facing. In just a few hours, he would be nailed to Calvary's cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of sins. God's covenant, full and free forgiveness through Christ. No wonder, no wonder, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to celebrate this supper with you. Incredible. He knew what he was there to establish. They were there to celebrate what was past. They were there to observe what was present. We'll celebrate it in a few minutes, the Lord's Supper, but they were also there to look forward. Again and again in the Old Testament, God talked about fellowship between him and his people as a banquet, a feast. And in the New Testament, Jesus described that feast as a heavenly wedding banquet. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said he would not eat this meal again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he added that he will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Uh, the rest of the Jews were looking for the kingdom of God to come in an earthly way. For the Messiah to be the leader, the king. A king that obviously Jesus wasn't going to be for them. No, Jesus' kingdom was not of this world, as he would tell Pilate in a few hours. The kingdom of God, Jesus once said, is within you. It's his rule of grace, his love in the hearts of sinful people. The kingdom of God is within you, and you are in that kingdom now by faith in Jesus Christ, and you look forward to the eternal bliss of being in that kingdom in the wedding banquet that you'll share with all believers in your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven. And as we Christians sit day after day, we long, we long to take part in that meal. But right now, there are enemies everywhere, just as there were on the night that Luke describes for us here for Jesus. Right now, there are enemies everywhere. You don't think I'm telling you the truth? You think I'm exaggerating things? Just try to stand up for something God says in his word and wait to see, you won't have to wait long, to see how our world reacts. It wants nothing to do with Christ. The world would be cheerful if the kingdom of God, if Christianity would end. It will do everything it can to put an end to that kingdom under the influence of none other than the greatest liar of all, the father of lies, Satan. Stand up for what God says in his word and you will quickly face opposition. And if the world can't oppose you, then it will somehow and in some way try to include you, to get you to think that somehow the world's ways are better that God's ways are not worth it. We are assaulted as Christians all the time, every day, by a sinful world and a sinful nature. And so we say tonight, how good for us to be in this room, not an upper room in Jerusalem, but God's house with our fellow Christians. Not that we haven't brought sin here with us, those sanctuary doors are not an airlock in which sin stays outside and cannot come in. No, where sinners gather, their sin is. But that doesn't surprise us. When Jesus gathered with his disciples, there were sinners there. Grave sinners. Even against Jesus' warning, Peter, you're going to dis disown me three times. Judas. <clears throat> Satan wants to sift you. You're going to deny me. Don't do it. But they did. No, this house, this room, is not for people who have made themselves holy. It is for people who have gathered to receive the message of forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. We look forward to that. Because out there in our lives, if we're not confronted with sin, we're stressed out by it every day. 
Nothing goes the way we want it to. Everything wears out, including ourselves. No matter how hard we try, it doesn't seem like God is blessing us the way we wanted him to. There is always frustration. How good. How good to be together here tonight. Because here the Lord shares with us his very body and blood. No, not as some Christians think, that just a representation, the bread represents the body, or is a symbol of the body, and the wine just represents or is a symbol of the blood. No, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Take, eat, take, drink, this is my blood. Paul would later talk about it. Those who receive the bread and wine in an unworthy manner, in an unprepared manner, eat and drink good judgment on themselves because this is the very body and blood of Christ. A miracle, just as we believe, takes place in baptism. The word with the water and a miracle. The word with the bread and the wine and the body and blood, a miracle. And it's here for you individually. Rest. Jesus once invited you, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you respite. And this is the one of the ways in his wisdom and his grace and his love, he does that. As God's people gather and receive the assurance of his forgiveness and the strengthening of their faith in him as their Savior and the assurance of eternal life with him, there is rest. And you're not just coming alone. You're standing shoulder to shoulder with God's people. God's people who are in this war with you. A life in which there is no peace outside of the church. A life in which there is no peace apart from Jesus Christ. We stand together and confess a common faith and state we are in this together with you, brother and sister in Christ. The forgiveness God extends to me is the forgiveness God extends to you, that I extend to you, that all extend to you. There is rest. There is God's rest. God on trial. And for a moment, there's a recess in the trial. As Jesus meets with his disciples in the upper room and gives them respite for what lies ahead, for a moment, there is a recess, God on trial. And in that recess, God gives us respite. A respite he gives us now. Through the message of forgiveness in the gospel and through the gospel, and it is given to us in the Lord's Supper. A respite that is a foretaste of the joy of heaven, the eternal bliss, the eternal rest. May the Lord Jesus tonight and every day assure you of that rest. Amen. Please remain seated. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. In this season of Lent, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering, which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving grace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Christ Jesus are called to love one another, to be servants of each other as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body partake most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal together. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns. The joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and one another.
Please stand. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives us our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and reconciled us to God, and has promised us the power to forgive and love one another. Relying on his promise, therefore, let us be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Tonight's first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, where we hear the account of the Passover. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without some of dead. So far the first reading. This evening's second reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. Paul applies the fact that the Holy, that Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, expresses a unity of faith of those who are participating. He says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So far the word of God. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand. The Holy Thursday Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 14. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, 
Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will be training, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated for the singing of the hymn of the day.
Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever, only, all for thee. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Eternal Savior, we are gathered in the quiet of this holy evening as you gathered with your disciples long ago. We are here to grasp how wide and long and high and deep your love is, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It was love for sinners that made you go willingly to the cross. Swords could have been drawn to protect you, and angels summoned to deliver you. Yet you did not allow it, because you were determined to make your life a guilt offering, the guiltless for the guilty. May we depend on nothing other than your willing love for the removal of our guilt and the forgiveness of our sins. It was self-giving love that made you take the role of a servant and stoop to wash your disciples' feet in that upper room. You set an example by which you would shatter pride and create humble servants out of all who follow you. By your love, shatter our pride and make us always more willing to serve than to be served. It was love for your Father in heaven that prompted you to enter the garden and approach his throne in prayer. There you sought grace and mercy in your time of need. There he strengthened you to do the work for which you were destined. Teach us to go to our Heavenly Father in every need as you did. Bless us with the grace and mercy to live out our lives in obedience and faith. It was love for your disciples in every age that caused you to institute Holy Communion. In the mystery and wonder of this sacrament, you give us your own body and blood. Through this heavenly feast, assure us of forgiveness, life, and salvation, and unite us with the church above. Lord, may your body and your blood be for our souls the highest good. We pray in your name, you who have also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also. Lift up your hearts. <coughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
the blood after the Son of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Save me. This word on the Lord, you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. the forgiveness of sins. God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hand. 